Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Expert Talk series. And thank you for making us part of your ALS journey. We're making progress in ALS research. We aim to discover new insights, improve our early detection, and find a cure for ALS. And you can help by joining our speech study. We would like, if it would be possible, to have you give us five speech recordings. These samples will be over five months, each lasting approximately 15 minutes. We welcome healthy individuals and those diagnosed with ALS and who are likely to have ALS to sign up. Please visit everythingals.org slash speech project and fill out our form. You'll find it on the web page and again in our chat. Thank you to everyone for being part of the solution. And now over to our founder and CEO, Indu Navar. Hello, Indu. Thank you, McFinn. And i um, so excited to actually have Merit Sikovic uh, here. And um, you know, I would consider her a very good friend. And, you know, through my, our personal journey when my husband was going through ALS is when I met Merit. And really, this is one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing, because I was just so um, moved by, you know, Merit's dedication to ALS. And I just wanted to join hands in anything we would do. And here we are in existence, which is everything ALS. And a um, little bit about um, Merit. Um, Merit uh, doesn't need an introduction because most of you know, Dr. Merit Sakovic is a director of uh, Sean M. Healy and AMG Center of ALS, chair of neurology at Mass General uh, Hospital and director and Julian Dorn, professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Sakovic, uh, research and clinical activities are dedicated to study the treatments of people with ALS. And um, also Merit has been one of the founders and pa past co-chairs of um, Northeast ALS Consortium, which is NEALS, that many of you know. It's a group of over 150 clinical sites in the United States, Canada, Europe, and Middle East dedicated to performing collaborative clinical trials and research in ALS. And Merit has brought uh, innovations to accelerate development of treatments and clinical trials uh, for people with ALS. She launched the first platform trial initiative in ALS, the Healy uh, ALS platform trial, the program that is accelerating therapy development. Merit completed her undergraduate with chemical engineering at MIT and then obtained a medical degree in health sciences and technology program at Harvard Medical School. And she served as a neurology resident and fellowship at Mass General Hospital, has obtained master's uh, degree in clinical epidemiology from Harvard Medical uh, School of Public Health. So with that, um, I would love to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Merit Sakovic to actually share with us, you know, what, what, what do we look forward to? Thank you, Indu, and thank you for having me back here. This is my uh, fa favorite webinar uh, series, and it's nice to see a lot of familiar uh, faces uh, here and to come back and um, be able to share some some new, you know, what's exciting that's coming up in 2025. So let me uh, share my slides again here. So I'm gonna gonna give an update on um, some of the the trials that are uh, we're gonna get results of uh, hopefully um, in the, very soon a few of them uh, some of the um, treatments are gonna start phase three trials or uh, large you know the, the last trial hopefully in 2025 um, and some of the innovations in gene therapies not not only for people who carry genes that cause the illness but also for the uh, what we call singleton or the non uh, genetic form of the illness, but before I start, I wanted to um, I wanted to dedicate today's talk to someone that a lot of you know, um, and um, um, that's that's uh, Doctor. I can forward. Okay, well, I have to hold that thought because that it's not working. Let me uh, try again. Uh, try this. Maybe this will work better. 
Yes. Um, uh, many of you know uh, Shalina Raji she, and her uh, children who have come off and on, on, on this webinar and work very closely with Indu and was honored to take care of her husband, Ais, or Dr. Laji, for many years. And he recently passed from ALS. Um, but I wanted to dedicate my talk to, um, to, the, to him and to his family because before I met them, I don't think uh, I knew the word repair and regeneration in ALS. Um, they really pushed me and other scientists to think about not just trying to slow down the illness, but how, how can we think about returning some function, whether that's a lot of function or a little function, but anything that would help and how do we get scientists to, to work on that? And now, um, not only have we seen some drugs where people have gotten better, uh, like some of the gene therapies, but we have people all over the world that are actually working on that part of the biology. And it's really thanks to, to their uh, inspiration for that. Um, so now, um, Progress is moving fast. It's not fast enough. And so part of what we do and you you guys are doing is how can we keep pushing the, the needle, you know, pushing it faster. Um, but one of the things that driving, I think, more success in our trials is, is the better understanding of the underlying biology of the illness. And the more we can understand about the biology in different in different people and in different stages of the illness, the better our drugs are going to be and the more likely success in the trials and also probably the shorter the trials can be. We do have four drugs uh, now on the market in some country. And I saw Dr. Brooks put in something about um, uh, the, I, I don't know how to say it, the rosabilin, which is also a methylcobalamin or a type of B12. But uh, we have, for a long time, we've had rilazole on the market that slows the illness by 10%. Uh, it's a small amount, but very reproducible. Like many trials have shown the same, same benefit. Uh, Radhakava that, um, at least in one study, slowed the illness by about 33% on top of rilazole, so that as an additive drug. Um, and then most recently, like a, two, a month ago, in Japan, um, rosabilin was approved for people with ALS. And this is a methylcobalamin or a type of B12 injection that people take twice a week. And there were two studies um, done on that. The first one uh, was in a, um, a, a couple hundred people followed for many years. And, and when they looked at everybody, they didn't see a benefit. But when they looked at people who started the treatment early, like in the first 15 or months or so from first symptom, they saw a big effect of 50% slowing of the illness. They did a second study in people who started it within the first uh, 12 months of symptoms and um, only for 16 weeks. But this time they saw again, a 40, about a 43 to 46% slowing of the illness. So two studies showing a very large effect of this drug. And so it's approved there. Hopefully, uh, ESI, which is the company that makes it, will be bringing it for approval in other countries. Uh, but that's the most recent uh, new drug that's on the market for people with ALS. Um, and then Calsati is a gene therapy that came on the market um, in 2023 for uh, people with SOD1 mutations. And that's the drug I was kind of referring to where we saw some people in the trial about 40 to 50% of people stop progressing and get better, which tells us it's possible if you uh, intervene and you have a drug that's really close to the cause of the illness. So that gives me a lot of hope. We have a pathway to get drugs to approval, but we clearly need um, you know, need more because at least for the non-genetic form of the illness, these drugs are still only slowing down the illness, not, not stopping it or reversing it. What also gives me hope is, is groups like this and a really engaged community who are actively part of clinical research is how we learn, how we get better diagnostics, how we get better treatments. And there's really like a global effort of, of uh, people in, in uh, throughout the world. Uh, North America is Niels, Enkels is Europe, uh, PACT ALS is all of Asia. And these are, are large uh, networks of uh, sites and researchers who are sharing information and bringing trials to people living close to them. And there's many, many companies in the space. So that also gives hope. And as I mentioned, there are now people working on repair and regeneration research, including a new initiative um, that I get to work with Indu and Bill Nudi on called Vision 2030. So this is a slide I borrowed from Jeff Rothstein. I know he's been here, so you've probably heard it, but I wanted to just put up one slide on mechanisms. And we learned a lot about good targets from studying the people who carry the familial form. And even though this is in you know 10 or 15% of people, we know that a lot of the biology we see here, we see in people even who don't carry those genes. So they tell us where to target. And so, for example, we know that in everybody with, almost everybody with ALS, there's a problem with a protein called TDP43. 
Um, and that protein should be in one part of your cell called the nucleus, but it, in people with ALS, it leaks out of that nucleus, kind of showed in the second picture here, and it aggregates in, in another part. And by doing that, you lose its normal function, which is really important for uh, uh, how proteins are made. And you also get aberrant function, like uh, you get proteins made incorrectly when it's in the wrong place. And why I want to highlight that is we know that happens in 98% of people with, with ALS. Some people carry a gene that causes it, but other people, it's happening for other reasons. And there's now several companies that in 2025 have drugs that can tackle this problem. Uh, so some some companies are working on plugging the, the nuclear the hole that's leading to the TDP43 going out. Other companies are disaggregating it so that um, it can go back into the nucleus. Um, so really creative approaches coming. Um, and and uh, I hope at least one or two, if not more, of those companies will be in clinical trials in 2025. So that, again, is our drugs that are getting closer and closer to the you know the cause of the illness. So that, again, it gives, gives a lot of hope. And I'll, I'll, I'll point out them as I go on my talk. The other thing that is really evolved is how we do trials. It, you know, in the days of Rilazol, they were very large studies, a thousand study patients in the in the trial, and it followed for like a couple of years. Uh, we now have the tools to uh, be more focused, where we can maybe do smaller trials in people with more similar biologies. We can use biomarkers, whether they're digital, like uh, ones that Indu and our team are developing, or fluid biomarkers, so we can get answers quicker. And we have now, at least in the U.S. and Canada, regulatory pathways to get drugs approved based on those biomarkers or based on single studies. So a lot of more efficiencies in just how we do the trials. So I'm going to review some of the small molecules and cell therapies, and then I'll touch a little bit about the gene modification approaches that are being used not just for the people with gene mutations, but also for the broader population, and then briefly tell you where we're going with the platform trial. So this is a long list and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I wanna point out that the drugs in purple have all had phase two studies um, with some positive results. And uh, at least four of them are going forward into that pivotal last trial. So prime C, CNMAU8, Predopidine neuron are all moving forward in 2025 to phase three trials. Um, and then on the, on the middle one, the ones in bold, those are all active phase three trials that are going to read out, uh, actually the first four are phase three trials that will read out uh, very soon. Um, and SBG302 is an early phase trial that will also read out its results. So we're going to have a lot of new information um, in the next month or two. So uh, just to highlight a few things on the on the purple group. So um, CNMAU8 and Predopidine were both drugs that we tested in our Healy platform trial, and they both had positive results on different features of the illness. CNMAU8 had a very large and significant effect on, on longevity uh, and also on critical um, features of the illness, like time to maybe needing a feeding tube or, or respiratory support. They, they delayed that that time. Uh, they also have an effect on neurofilament. So they're moving forward on planning and, and starting a phase three trial. Predopidine uh, had its biggest effect actually on a voice measure uh, that you heard about how important that study is. It was able to show in, in everybody an effect on speech uh, characteristics, but also in, in um, a subpopulation of people kind of earlier and in, in the illness uh, who had a faster course, they also saw um, a slowing of progression, um, as well as an effect on a biomarker neurofilament. So they're going forward in 2025 with the phase three trial that will be uh, global. So the um, I'm going to show you a little bit of the data on Prime C and, and the next steps on neuron. But before I go there, I just want to talk about the trials that we're going to have results on soon. Um, the first one, whose name is very hard, Lenzumestro cell, or something close to that, is a, um, a stem cell trial that's ongoing in, in South Korea. Uh, the company's name was CoreStem before, and they are in a phase three trial with results expected sometime next year. Uh, PTC 857, I'm going to show you a little about, we're waiting for the results of their phase three trial. And the next two are in the platform trial, and we're hoping for results uh, shortly as well. Uh, the, the ones below with the asterisks are all enrolling participants now. So the Budalas, Mesitinib, the Curalis drug, they're all looking for participants uh, now. Um, so a lot of activity in the, in the field. 
So just to highlight the ones that we're waiting for results uh, soon, uh, PTC-857 is a drug by this company, PTC. It uh, inhibits this uh, enzyme called 15 lipooxygenase, and it's really important for blocking damage from uh, lipids uh, oxidation, from iron um, oxidative damage. And they have a lot of data in people with ALS that there's uh, markers of that type of damage and their drug can lower um, those markers. So they've done um, a pivotal trial uh, called Cardinals where they've uh, enrolled about 260 people um, I, on drug or placebo for 24 weeks followed by open label extension. That uh, drug is, uh, that study is, is I think completed and uh, in the analysis phase. So we're looking forward to, to seeing the results of that soon. Prime C is an, another drug that recently um, finished its phase two study and is planning a phase three in 2025. This is a combination of two old drugs, uh, celecoxib and ciprofloxacin. Celecoxib uh, block, works on inflammation. The ciprofloxacin works on iron metabolism, a bit like the, in a different way, but in a similar target to the PTC, and also works on microRNA dysfunction. Uh, so we came, those drugs came out of a drug screen in a couple different models. And I'll just show you briefly that um, the combination of the drug uh, in these models, uh, this is a fish model that has TDP43 biology. It could improve uh, motor performance. It could reverse the synaptic uh, uh, abnormalities. Those are the connections between the neurons. And also in a, in a model of in the in the dish where you could grow people's uh, motor neurons from their blood stem cells, uh, it, it uh, prolonged survival. Um, and the combination always did better than either drug alone. So that was really the science that led to them doing the clinical trial. So there was two clinical trials. The first one was a small study looking at biomarkers there, where they were able to show that they lowered measures of inflammation and also they lowered a measure of TDP43 in the blood as well. And from that study, they went on to their uh, phase 2B study called Paradigm. This was uh, uh, 68 people that were randomized either to drug or placebo for six months and then followed by open label extension for um, you know more than 12 months. And people are still in that part of the study. They were looking at safety and biomarkers uh, as well as function. And Basically, the first thing is they didn't really see any safety issues of the drug, so that's that's important. Um, and they did see in this uh, small study, um, you know, and a slowing of progression is measured by the ALS functional rain scale of uh, about thirty percent uh, in the in the six month uh, double blind period. And then when they looked at people. Uh, who started it six months earlier than the other the people who were initially on placebo and then went to drug, they showed a, 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 a continued separation favoring people who started the drug early. So based on um, these data, they are they are now um, you know planning a phase three trial that will be uh, global and uh, enrolling in twenty twenty five. Um, so I wanted to just give an update on where things are with neuron. I know that they've come and spoken here and people know a lot about this drug. This is a, a stem cell um, treatment, uh, mesenchymal stem cells that are taken from people's bone marrow and they secrete growth factors that are anti-inflammatory and help uh, motor neuron survival. They had completed a phase three trial that um, when they looked at everybody, uh, they did not see success, but when they looked at uh, people who started the drug uh, earlier in the illness, um, uh, that they, they they did see a benefit. So they're doing now a study in that population. So this will be people within um, you know less than two years from first symptom onset um, who have on this ALS functional range scale at least a two on all the all the questions and breathing over 65. Um, there'll be a 24 week uh, double bind period followed by open label extension. And that trial is, is slated to start uh, very soon uh, in the United States. So that's just a whirlwind of some of the small molecules and cell-based approaches. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about any drug that I didn't get to or anything that I spoke way too fast about. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit now about um, really the technology of using these gene modification approaches to turn off or turn on proteins of interest and how this is going to be really, really important in ALS. I mean, it already is, but it's, it's going to be even more. So I'll just point out a few things. So, um, you know, 
one of the you know the first gene that was found in the genetic form of ALS was SOD1, and we do have that marketed drug now for people with uh, that form of ALS called Calsati. And the very exciting thing is now there's a trial um, in people at risk for SOD1 ALS, so gene carriers who are asymptomatic, and they're in the trial to see if Calsati can prevent or significantly delay onset of the illness, and that study is actively enrolling all over the world. But there's now um, you know, three other companies working on different ways to turn off SOD1. And this is just you know, the, the innovation that you need because right now Calcetti is a great drug, but you have to get an injection every month. And um, while 40 to 50% of people stop progressing and get better, which is great, not everybody. So there's room for uh, you know improvement on the way it's delivered as well as efficacy. Um, so there's um, a couple companies, Unicorn, uh, Unicure, has a, um, a, a way where it's a one-shot one treatment using a gene therapy called an AAV10, um, and they are actively enrolling participants right now. Uh, Regeneron has a um, another way. This is um, a chemical a modification of an antisense oligo to get better penetration into the spinal cord and uh, good lowering of SOD1, and they've started enrolling in Canada. And then um, Voyager is working on a vectorized way to shut off the SOD1 uh, protein where they can give this treatment um, in the blood instead of in the spinal fluid. So again, making it easier to, to deliver this. So a lot of innovations on that uh, form of the illness, but what we learned from those approaches is going to be um, applicable to other ones. Uh, there's a global trial of a gene therapy for another genetic form of ALS uh, called FUS ALS that's enrolling right now. And there's approaches to, to um, uh, really try to target the most common genetic form, C9 or 72, and also a gene called UNC13A, which is a risk factor for ALS and one that's associated with a faster course. Uh, so lots of activity in that field. Um, but there's also efforts to use the same technology for the what we now call singleton ALS, meaning uh, there's uh, only one person uh, in the family uh, with it, and that if someone doesn't carry a known gene for it. Um, and this is using, again, the same technology to try to lower or raise a drug of interest. And I'll show you some of the data on the Curalis one, which is enrolling right now. That's the first one here. But I wanted to tell you about two others that are coming. Um, so one is by a company Vectory, that's VTX002. So this is one of the drugs I was mentioning that's going after TDP43. So this is using something called a vectorized antibody. So you can use that uh, the, the viruses, the AAVs, to, which are like a delivery way to get into the motor neuron and you can attach something to it, like an antibody that can get rid of the TDP43. So they're, um, again, in the preclinical stage, but planning to go into people. Um, and then Amelix, which is a company that had uh, Relivrio, they have a licensed in another drug, which is an antisense oligo against an enzyme called Calpane, done some really elegant work with Sammy Barbuda at Michigan, and they are planning a clinical trial in, again, the broader population of what we call sporadic or singleton ALS. So same gene therapy technologies, but for the broader group. So I wanted to just mention the Curalis trial. People are very excited about this one. Uh, this is actively enrolling in Canada and the UK and uh, in other parts of Europe, uh, not in the US uh, currently. So this is based on some data that when the TDP43 is in the wrong part of the cell, it um, it, it, it uh, results in this protein called Staphmin2 being made incorrectly. And Staphmin2 is really important for how your motor axons, the connections between your motor neurons and your muscles, how that stays uh, connected. And when that um, is made incorrectly, the motor axons uh, kind of die back. They pull away from the muscle. And at least in the lab, if you can make full length Staphmin2, the normal protein, those nerve axons regrow. Uh, so that was the rationale for making um, a gene therapy that can help your body make full length Staphmin 2. Um, so this is for all forms of ALS. Um, it's administered into the spinal fluid. People get three doses uh, monthly. Um, the, these antisense algos tend to last a long time. Um, it's, uh, they've done two groups already. So it, when you're doing a study first time in people, you usually start with a small number of people. So eight people, for example, like six will get the drug, two get the placebo. 
Um, and then if that's safe, you go to the next dose. And so they're now in the third dose and they've expanded that to be more than eight people. So people are again, excited about this science and technology. So then in my uh, closing time, I just wanna give people an update on where we are on the platform trial. And I hope we can come back and, and get even into a lot more details because we have um, uh, several companies we're working on uh, to start uh, in 2025. So as, as many of you know, this was a really a community effort to try to see how we could go faster in clinical trials. And uh, we worked uh, with our many people living with the, uh, NLS. Our, we have a great patient advisory group, our sites and the FDA to design a trial that is much faster um, and uh, is very patient centered. And um, in this trial, for example, we, you know, we share the data from people on placebo between the, uh, the regimens so that each group can be smaller, it can be faster, and also it's one protocol. So when we want to add a new drug, instead of starting all over again, um, you know, we just amend the protocol. So you can add a, a drug, a regimen in about 30 days, as opposed to the usual time of about a year to get started on a new drug. So we have now tested seven drugs um, in this platform trial. Um, and, and we did it in the time that usually you might get through one drug or two drugs. Of those uh, seven, the first five, we have the results and we've shared those. Um, two of them have positive results that I mentioned before, the regimen C and regimen D, and three were clearly negative. So they're, uh, they're not moving forward. Um, but we learned a lot uh, from all five. And uh, I'm very excited again about both regimen C and D. They both have um, expanded access protocols funded by ACT for ALS. Uh, and they're both moving forward to phase three testing. They learned a lot. They learned the right dose. They learned, you know, the population that might respond best. They learned the outcome measures that it might uh, go go uh, best as well. Um, we are uh, finished enrollment and finished actually follow up in the in the double blind period or what we call the randomized control period for regimen F and G. Um, so we're now uh, entering what we call the analysis phase. And then as soon as we have those results, obviously we'll be sharing them uh, with the participants and then with the, the broader population. We are working with um, Farm Aust. We've announced that they're gonna be a Regimen H and hopefully start um, in uh, Q2 or so of 2025. We are also um, in design with two other companies. Um, they haven't gone public yet, but as soon as they do, uh, we, we like to share their results. And we have actually accepted two others uh, and just are doing some contracting. So I'm hoping in 2025, we'll be enrolling three to five new regimens in the platform trial. We have decided to change the protocol a little bit, and we've met with our patient advisory group on this and gotten great feedback. And two of the main changes I want to just highlight is we have decided to go a little longer. These studies were all six months, but what we're learning is that some drugs might really just take a little longer to have efficacy, and you don't want to abort like too soon. And so we uh, kind of did some modeling and we are going to um, go for nine months. Uh, that, so we've amended the protocol for that. Um, and we're also going to um, shorten the time from symptom onset to, um, uh, to entry to two years from three years. Um, and that is um, really driven by getting a population that we're most likely to get a result that's clear in that in that time. So um, we can um, hopefully have a single study that might lead to approval. Um, and we want to do that really by having parallel expanded access programs for people who might want to be in the study but aren't eligible. So those are two of the changes that we're making. Um, and uh, we'll we'll come back at either here or another webinar to go through all the modeling. But we showed it to our patient advisory group who who um, gave us great feedback and really actually appreciated seeing all the modeling and the reasoning for some of the changes. So that's now um, approved by ethics. It's at FDA for review, and we're hoping we'll launch that again in, in 2025. So we still have our, our great uh, um, uh, patient navigators for the platform trial, as well as for other trials, Catherine Small and Allison Blatt, who can be reached at, at this number or the email. Um, and they're, they're um, just they're helping people uh, find trial sites, whether it's for the platform trial or otherwise. So please reach out if you, if you need some help finding a, a trial or, or, or learning more about trials. So I hope I've convinced you that it's an exciting time and we are making progress. Uh, we still have to go faster. Um, I think these, these new gene modification approaches are going to be very effective, not just for people with the genetic forms, but also for the people with the sporadic form. It really allows uh, uh, the ability to, to target particular proteins of interest 
as you understand more about the biology. Um, I worked with a fabulous group at Niels and uh, 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 at Vision 2030 with Indu and, and then at our Healy Center. And a lot of our work is funded by the major foundations in ALS. So I want to just give a shout out to, to really a big community. And thank you to everybody that's been part of uh, our trials and other trials and other research studies. Thank you. So hopefully I left some time for questions. I saw that a lot of them were coming in, but I haven't read them. Yes. Uh, thank you, Merit, for um, this great delivery of the presentation. There was a lot of material. So um, there are some questions. So let me get into. So Sylvia and myself, my team, um, we're going to ask you the questions so you don't have to worry about what's mm -hmm. coming in. So um, well, first question is, how do we get into these trials that you have mentioned? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So that's why I do think it's important to have trial navigators. So so one one is I think if you're at an ALS center, they, they should be able to help you if either if they have the trial at their site, but if they don't, what the closest site is to you. So I, I'd say one avenue is your neurologist. If your neurologist doesn't know, then I think that there are a couple of resources. There's there's a, a great trial navigator site at ALS TDI with contacts of, of people that, at the sites. I think IMALS also has a trial finder. Um, uh, our, our two folks, Catherine and Allison, can help. But the best thing, like I, I think for my patients, like if if we're not doing one of the trials, like we're not in the Buddha last trial, if someone's interested in that, I'll make a call to that site for them. And so I, I think if hopefully you have a doctor that will do that. Yeah. And I will add, please come and ask us during the expert talk series. So. The second question is, could you please elaborate on the gene-targeted approaches being investigated for C9 or for 72? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, there, there were there were uh, two um, antisense algo, uh, uh, algotherapy trials for C9 or for 72 that didn't work. Um, and so, so people haven't given up, but there's a couple uh, companies uh, and, and academic groups trying to do... Um, Combination. So we think that we might have to block not just the one copy of the gene mutation, but also the other copy. So for every gene, we have kind of two copies of it uh, called a sense and anti sense. So that's one way that people are, are uh, trying to make a, com a combo uh, gene therapy. Uh, and other groups are trying to just cut out the gene using CRISPR. So there, none of those are quite ready for, for people. There have been some. Um, small molecule trials, so for C9 that look hopeful. Um, Laura Raynham is doing a trial of metformin, um, and those results should be available, I think, also uh, by the end of the year. And then Transposon just shared some of their results for C9 uh, that look very good. So these are not gene therapy approaches, but they're uh, targeting people with C9 over 72. So the next question is, what do you think about the recent uh, announcement from Western Ontario a uh, group on ALS development. Yeah, I think, first of all, Michael Strong is a phenomenal scientist, so I think it's good science. I think the um, the, the reporters probably used adjectives that were a, a little overblown, meaning that it's it's in the it's in the lab stage. It, they're really trying to um, identify uh, this way to, to target that TDP43. It just, it's still a couple of years away, as far as I understand from people. So it's good science. Um, but it's not quite in, in ready for people yet, unfortunately. The next question is um, regarding the clinical trials. Is enrollment criteria going to change from 36 months to 24? Right, so for the Healy ALS platform trial, we, we are going to change that um, uh, from 36 to 24. And we did that only after a, a lot of, lot of uh, analytics, looking at our data from the first five and um, and seeing that we could, first of all, it wouldn't it, there wouldn't be too many people that wouldn't be allowed in. So we looked at that percent, um, but also that it would it would uh, um, increase our power to tell if the drug worked or not in in the nine month period. So sometimes, um, you know, if people are in the study who have a naturally slow course, which is great for the person in it, it, it makes it hard to tell if the drug works or not. So some of the criteria are to try to get a group of people who might be changing a little faster so that you can tell if your drug works or not in a trial. So it's a kind of a balance between being very inclusive, but also making sure that you, you can actually tell if your drug works in the end. 
And so our modeling on the first five really told us that that would really increase our power if, if we made that change. Thank you, Merit. Um, regarding the other SOD1 trials you mentioned, if someone is on Kalsadi already, uh, are they becoming, are they ineligible to participate in the, uh, the other SOD1 trials? It's a good question. And they're, they're not all the same. So that, that will be where it would be really important to, to talk to the, um, uh, the, the site that's doing it. Um, some of them will allow prior use, but you have to come off of it for that, for the duration of that trial. Um, some of them are, are, you know, absolutely not, no, uh, no prior Calsati. Um, some of the trials have gone to, uh, they're, they're in, you know, for example, Canada, but they might also be in, in countries where Calsati isn't uh, there yet. Uh, some, some countries in Asia, for example. The next question is, is NU9 in trials still active? Yeah, so NU9 is is um, not yet in, in the clinical trials. I, I do believe that they're uh, either about to start phase one or they're close to phase one. And, and so that phase one will be in uh, people without any illness, just looking at dosing and safety. And uh, a after that, they go into uh, people with ALS. But it's definitely still you know, being developed. So um, the next question is, um, what is known about Tofersen non-responders? As you have noted, about 40 to 50% of the patients saw benefits. What have we learned from the people who did not get the benefit? Good question. And I, I might have misspoken a little bit. So I, we do think that everybody's getting a benefit, but there were 40 to 50% who had uh a huge benefit, meaning that that we saw them, you know, stop progressing and and, and getting and some of them getting better. Um, we don't know the reason. So we the, some of it is um, earlier um, intervention, but that's not all, that's not all the reason. So um, you know, people are looking at things like could it be you know drug distribution or drug dose for that person, um, but it's it's uh, it's not it's not clear yet why. But we, I do know that for that illness and for all illnesses, you know, we really want this early diagnosis and early intervention. That's really happening now for people with SOD1. I think people are getting diagnosed much sooner and started right away. Another question is, is rosobolamine FDA approved? Um, this, per this person wants to know, um, since they're getting their B12 injections via compounding pharmacy and it hasn't been covered by insurance. It's not um, FDA approved in the U.S. It's a, it's approved in Japan by their FDA. Um, uh, as far as I know, Isai, which is the company that makes it, has not yet filed uh, uh, with the FDA. So until or unless they file, then the FDA just can't review it. So at, at the moment, you, uh, you're right, that in the U.S., the only way to get it is through compounding. Uh, I, I will say that a lot, most trials are now allowing people to be on methylcobalamin or this drug Um you know, the Healy platform trial is. So I, I think we're treating it as it's, you know, uh, going to become part of standard of care. So um, the other question was about TDP43. Is that still, is that an issue in SOD1 as well? Um, is it just sporadic? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Yeah, so I, I kind of uh, mentioned that 98% of the people have it and the the, the People that we don't see a lot of TPDP43 biology in are the people with SOD1, ALS, and also those with FUS or FUS. But everybody else, we, we see it as a, as a major um, bi biological uh, problem. The next question is, who is doing ALS gene targeted approach for C9? Oh, so, uh, and ac academically, um, I, I'd say there's a couple groups. So um, UMass, Dr. Robert Brown is, is working on that, as well as um, Dr. Jeff Rothstein at Hopkins. Uh, there's um, um, uh, Neil Schneider also has the Silence ALS program, which is which is amazing at Columbia. Um, Company-wise, I, I know, obviously, there's Ionis was involved in it, um, and uh, there's there's a few others as well. So the next question is, is there a reliable cell model such as iPSC uh, neuron model that shows both loss of TDP43 in the nucleus and TDP43 aggregation in the cytoplasm? 
Yeah, I, I, I do think there are, there is. So there's, there's, um, there's an, an effort to kind of um, tackle this problem where in some people's laboratories, they can, they can take the motor neurons, uh, the stem cells from people, grow their motor neurons, stress the motor neurons a little bit, and they can stress them in different ways. And then they get the TDP43 biology, but the same approach in other labs doesn't do anything and they don't see it. So there is this um, effort, I, I can't remember who's funding it, but there's a, a consortium that's getting together to solve this problem and, and figure out how we can um, get a reproducible model that can um, then get scaled up for, for uh, drug testing. Thank you. What exactly is the difference between B12 and the CNMAU8 compound? They but they seem both are working on the energy compound of motor neuron functions and the mitochondrial level. Yeah, I think they they have some overlapping targets, but they 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 function very differently. I would say the CNMAU8 is really it's a catalyst, so it's a gold gold nanocrystals. It gets into your motor neurons, so it's very good delivery, and it catalyzes a, a number of pathways that are important for energy metabolism and oxidative toxicity. So one of the things it does, it helps you make something called NAD or NAD, which is the first step in how your cells make energy. Um, but it also catalyzes uh, um, glutathione pathways for oxidative toxicity. So it does a couple of things more than I think the, the methylcobalamin. But, but in the big picture, they're you know, targeting the same kind of branch of the problem. So, um, you know, you mentioned a little bit about how we need to expedite ALS drug development. Uh, can you speak a little bit about how AI can be used or is being used to help expedite our drug development process? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I think it's, it's, a, it's we're just at the beginning of this and I think it can be done in a couple different ways. I think in trials, I think people are thinking about, can you... Um, can you use natural history data sets and create um, whether you call it digital twins or, or, or like our matching controls so that you can maybe get rid of placebo groups um, and, and kind of match people to um, people like them in a data set and use AI to kind of create those, those closer matches. And there's, there's a lot of data out there now that, that can be used. I don't know that the FDA would ever approve a drug on that, but you could see, not yet at least, you could see that as uh, your initial phase two screen, again, a way to, to uh, lower cost and, and speed up drug development. But people are also using it for the biology to see if you can um, you know, really mine all the data out there on the biology of the illness and um, segregate people by different biologies and then, and then develop drugs that way. Um, if you haven't had uh, Fink, uh, Steve Finkbeiner speak here, he's probably the the expert in the in the world of ALS of, about the five or six ways that AI can help uh, in um, drug discovery. Thank you. The next question is: Is the drug being considered um, aluxurin? I think this was um, pertaining to one of your slides. Yeah, I. Um, Oh my goodness, all the different names. I think that one, I can't remember if that's the PTC one or that FMS one, because they both start with the letter U. But I'll just say both of them. So there's um, the PTC drug is uh, in its, we're just waiting for the results. It's finished its phase 2B study. And that's the one that works on iron related oxidative damage. The, yes. Um, yeah. Had to quickly Google it. <laughs> yes, I don't know why they make these names so difficult. So um, another question is: since some of these prime C and um, uh, other drugs are available, uh, you know, over the counter, is it a good idea to start taking them if you're not eligible for a trial? Yeah, I think this is a very like, personal discussion with your physician, I would say. And I, and I can say how I discuss it with people. I, I'd like to give people all the information so they can make their decisions. So, um, you know, what's the data on B12? I mean, now it's a little easier because it's FDA approved there. But, you know, the two studies and what it shows, you know, and, and um, especially if I see someone who is in the first 12 or 15 months of symptom onset, I, I think, you know, that that's where it shows a huge benefit. So I I, I Unfortunately, it's just not covered by insurance right now. So it's, it's a, that's why I say it's a bit of a personal choice. But I, I like 
people to know about that. If someone has it like later, you know, if I see them after two or three, so there was one study that really didn't show any benefit. The, the Cipro Celebrex is a, is a harder discussion because there's only been one study, uh, one you know, controlled study, and it's very small. And we know uh, from prior experiences, for example, the Relivrio story, that sometimes these small studies, when you go to big studies, they don't reproduce. So there, I think there's like, there's more uncertainty about whether it works or not. And so then that is that personal discussion about um, how much uncertainty someone's okay with versus, you know, again, trying to go into a trial. Next question is, is there any data you can share on the microbiome study? Uh, you know, there's been a couple microbiome studies. Um, you know, we did one, but there's been ones in Israel and other countries, and they definitely show abnormalities in people with ALS. And it, it um, there's um, and the microbiome actually looks very similar to the microbiome we see in people with multiple sclerosis as well. Um, and but how to interpret that? And that might be where AI comes in as well, because it's it's like you know billions of bacteria and and different. You know it, it, what we don't know is is cause or effect is is the microbiome changing because of the illness and you're changing your diet and and the, or is it you know causative and um you know people are now looking at the microbiome in people who are gene carriers you know before onset uh, and they're doing some animal studies there. I'd say if um, there's really good data in multiple sclerosis in Alzheimer's that it might be you know at least on the causal pathway. And they figure that out a lot from animal studies, but we don't have that same rigor of studies yet in the US. So, um, you know, as um, drugs show results and patients make them part of their treatment, will trials allow PALS who are taking propadine, for example, participate in another platform trial? Yeah, and uh, not yet. So, so usually trials will say if if something's on the market, uh, then that's okay. So obviously, Rilazole and, and Radicava are fine. When Relivrio was on the market, that was fine. I do think now um, the majority of trials are saying the the B twelve and ethylcobalamin is fine, but but uh, like Pradopi and something like that, that's not yet on the on the market in any country um, would still be considered experimental, so that you couldn't do both. The next question is, when will the initial results from the SPG302 trial in Australia be coming out? I don't know the exact date or time, but I hope soon. I, I think uh, they've they've uh, enrolled all their participants um, and uh, hopefully soon. And I'm excited about that drug. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, again, a different approach. Um, again, I, I kind of bucket it into that repair group about making new connections between your neurons. But the study is small. It's, it's uh, you know, I think 11 or, or so participants are really looking at biomarkers. Um, so they're, they'll definitely they don't have to do another study uh, looking at efficacy, but this will help them know that they're hitting their target and their dose. So um, one question is that I think probably, you know, it's a difficult one. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you think about a drug that decreases NFL by 12%? Uh, should a people person with ALS continue in that trial or consider another uh, development drug? Yeah, that is such a good question. It's hard. So there's a, two parts to it, I'll say. One is we don't know um, the amount of change that's going to be important. Like we, we know the extreme. We know 50% in, in the Traverse and Calsati study that predicted clinical response, but that's a big effect. Um the, the nerve film itself kind of changes um, within a person. And so, so we've had lots of debates about how, how much is variability just within a person and how much is real. And I don't think the field has decided yet, but we it's probably 15% or more. Like we just see in the natural history uh, changes in the, you know, the 10% or less. So one thing is, is being able to know if it's noise or not. And then the other part of the question is, do all drugs that work clinically have to lower neurofilament? I, and we just don't know that yet. So I would not want to throw out a drug just because it wasn't lowering neurofilament enough. Um, and we, you know, we just don't know that that's going to be a, a, a direct link or not. Um, okay, but I'm excited that we have neurofilament. I mean, it's a beginning, but we need more biomarkers. That's probably not going to be sufficient. Sorry. 
No, no worries. The next question is regarding regimen H. Um, could you speak more about the new drug and why it was chosen and when is that announced? Oh, so we, we announced the um, farm Ost, um shortly after they, they signed up with us. So uh, I'd say you know, companies have a choice whether they want to announce it then or if they want to wait until they've gotten the FDA approval and stuff. So they, they were fine to announce it right away. Um, they had done a small study in Australia that had some uh, very exciting, you know, positive results. We like their their preclinical data, um, so we're we we've we're, we're done through design with them. I, I'm I'm hoping I don't know exactly when it's going to start, but I think probably Q two of twenty of twenty twenty five. We will do a webinar uh, on the whole science, uh, you know, a little closer to when it's going to enroll, um, and then record that so that's available for people. Okay. So, um, so uh, one question was that, you know, you mentioned brainstorm in your uh, uh, deck. What is the latest on the stem cell study and uh, regarding brainstorm? Yeah, so they, they have a phase, what not the phase 3B. Uh, so this, because they've done a phase three, this is the next one in, in people early in the, in the illness. They have that protocol written. They've I've met with the FDA. They have the FDA approval on that and the statistical plan. So they're they're um, they pick their sites and they're getting ready to enroll. I, I hope it will be enrolling in December or January. So it's it's quite close. All righty. The next question is what what were your impressions of the DNL three forty three so far? Oh, so I don't I don't have any results of that. So you know, when we do the trials, we're um, you know, we, we don't know who's on it or who's not on it. And we, we, we really can't look at the efficacy data until the database is locked and, and sent to the statisticians. So we're, so I don't have any, um any, you know, insight into whether it works or not. Um, but we're, um, we're starting to get into that phase of, of, uh, of uh, getting ready to start the analysis. So um the other question is like, you know, what, you know, gene therapy targeting for TDP43 in sporadic. What are the trials that's going on for sporadic ALS for targeting TDP43? I think those are the ones that are going to come in 2025. So I, I mentioned one um, by Vectory, that, which is uh, um, it's using the AAV technology to get an antibody into the into the motor neuron to disrupt the aggregates. Um I don't have a timeline on that. Sometimes companies won't share a timeline until they, you know, they have their FDA discussions and they know that they're ready to go. Um, um, there's other companies that are working on other antibody approaches to get rid of it, a bit like the Alzheimer's drugs, where they use uh, antibodies given intravenously to um, get rid of a misfolded protein. Um, there's, you know, three companies working on uh, something called PIK5 inhibitors. And and while it's not direct, uh, like like the Vectory one, it does um, have data that it might get rid of TDP43. So that's um, AI Therapeutics, um, uh, Verge Genomics, and um, Takeda, if I remember them. Yeah. And I think Verge is, is enrolling participants right now. Another question is, what was your what is your impression about SPG three hundred two, and is it the only one that claims to reverse symptoms? So first, I say that we don't know that it reverses symptoms. So it's it's in a phase one study uh, with just a few few people, and we haven't seen any results. So it, it um, but it, it the mechanism is is about um, helping make new connections between neurons. Um, so I kind of. I could be wrong about this, but I, I kind of put that in cure all this in, in a kind of a bit of a repair um, market. Um, so cure all this is the one I mentioned that helps your, your nerve axons uh, kind of regrow, uh, at least in the lab. And they're in uh, phase one right now. So we've got a couple more questions, uh, Merit. I know you're on a, a run its end of your day. Um, uh, what do you, what can you say about the Koya trial? And are they going to be on the Healy platform as well? Um, I, I, I do like them. I, I do consult for them. So I got my conflict of interest there. But, um, you know, they're, they're using a combination of two drugs that tackle different parts of the uh, inflammation pathway or the immune response to the illness. And, and Dr. Appel has you know, some very good pilot data from four people. 
um, they are not going to be in the platform trial. They're going to, uh, I think, plan a standalone trial. Um, and hopefully also in sometime Q1 or Q2 of, uh, uh, maybe Q2 of 2025. I don't know exactly the date. The next question is, what are your thoughts on the C9 or 72 vaccine being developed in Germany? You know, I'd like, I think it's a creative approach. Um, I, you know, again, th that is the most common genetic form and it's, 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 um, it's been hard to, uh, to tackle and, and it's, and it's not alone in being hard to tackle. Like there's, there's many other neurological illnesses that have these, what we call repeat disorders where there's a part of the gene that repeats many, many times like Huntington's disease and in all the attempts, the first attempts at gene therapies haven't worked in, in any of those. So I think whoever figures out you know, how to, how to tackle one of them, it's going to help all of them. And the vaccine approach might, you know, just, is just another way to try to try to get at it. So I don't know whether it's going to work, but I think it's a you know, good idea to pursue. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Merit, for your time here and answering the questions. And those questions that were not answered, we'll send it to you and we will um, respond uh, to the community. And thank you for taking your time. We really appreciate it. And um, and your recording will be online this weekend by Sunday. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Thank you for inviting me. What more do you want except the cure? That's what we all want. But we know that these doctors are working really hard. And you can see tonight with all the information that our guest revealed to us that this is an ongoing 24 hour a day around the world. What are we gonna call this? A challenge that we're meeting. And so what I like to say to each, of you, each one of you is that you're very important on this journey because there's things that you experience that make you really helpful to the rest of the people here because we have people who have questions and the more people that we have together we have more answers so i would like to thank all of you for being here tonight